Thanks, Nicole, and thanks, everyone. Um, congratulations for being a hardy crew to, to rejoining or, or for your patients in, in starting this and the reschedule, of course. Um, so anyway, hi, as I said, and my name's Ruth Lewis, and I'm here to present Engineering Collective Wisdom AI Ethics. Now, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country um, where I'm presenting from in Melbourne, Australia, and recognise the, the traditional custodians' continuing connection to land, waters and community. And we pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past and present and emerging. So let me introduce myself. Um, I have had many years in the IT industry as an engineer and strategic IT consultant and completed a master's in strategic foresight from Swinburne University in Melbourne, Australia. Now I'm really excited to talk to you about AI ethics and in particular, the personal journey that I took from a Swinburne University subject through to being involved in the evolution of AI ethics. So this is what we will cover in this short presentation. Um, firstly, we will discuss the opportunities and challenges of AI development as a 21st century challenge and briefly cover the history of computer ethics and where we are at present in the industry for developing solutions to the AI ethics challenge, including introducing a values-based approach to the future. And this will lead to a discussion of international standards. And I will focus in particular on some initiatives that I have been involved with, with the IEEE and its social impact standards initiatives, including the new IEEE 7000 2021 standard process and finishing up with a brief use case and any questions that you can submit in the chat window as Nicole had mentioned. And then we will, just, we will follow with an open forum discussion. So the development of AI systems brings an IT opportunity. From an economic point of view of earning almost 1 trillion US dollars by 2028, and an optimistic view for a growing field of hundreds of AI use cases to solve humanity's problems. Imagine being able to generate efficient, sustainable energy, reverse climate change, diagnose and treat cancers, control epidemics and solve the world's food crisis. AI's ability is driven by the availability of data, embedded devices, connectivity, compute power, deep learning methods, and of course, financial returns that are increasing all the time through, sub through subsidies and through demand. However, the pessimistic view is that whilst society has the smarts it doesn't necessarily have the wisdom to develop these powerful new technologies. And evidence to support this view includes personal privacy violations and technology addiction, such as online shopping, games, gambling, and the use of social media, where algorithms deliberately feed you more of what you want to see in such a way that you lose the ability to stop yourself. Fake news generation, where AI can create a fake news article that looks so authentic that it can influence people's opinions, particularly to generate fear or greed motivations. And human bias, and many of you may realize that increasingly AI algorithms decide whether you may be able to get a mortgage or a job interview, <clears throat> which may be refused on the basis of your gender or your background or if you get unfairly profiled by the police as a possible criminal on the basis of your appearance. A recent example of privacy violations through AI facial recognition occurred in Australia late last year, where US 
company, based company, Clearview AI, has, which has collected 10 billion images of people from social media sites and other public sources. And they sell these images to various police forces and other businesses around the world. Now, Clearview AI was used by several Australian police agencies to conduct searches for people of interest. The Office of the Australian Information Commissioner found that Clearview AI was in breach of privacy legislation for collecting images and biometric information from individuals in Australia without their consent and by unfair means for the purposes of commercial gain. Clearview AI have been ordered to destroy all Australian images collected due to the lack of transparency around Clearview AI's data collection practices and the monetization of individuals' data for a purpose entirely outside reasonable expectations. And the risk of adversity to people whose images are included in their database, particularly placing these individuals at risk of harm. So these are all examples of services and technologies that have been developed based on AI without consideration of societal values, only economic gain or efficiency as a goal. And some of these cases reflect the inherent bias unconsciously embedded in the system by the technology developer. Some of them manipulate the worst aspects of the human psyche some may even violate aspects of international human rights and bring out the worst aspects of people, both their users and the people who might be indirectly affected by their users. Now, I became in, involved in this area back in 2017 through the Masters of Strategic Foresight course at Swinburne University. As one of the last of the graduates before this course sadly succumbed to the might of economic imperatives. The subject was 21st century challenges and was led by course coordinator Joe Voros, where we needed to identify a wicked problem in the world that required a solution and essentially to, be, to become part of that solution through historical and future analysis of the problem and the social change that was needed. Now, as part of my research, I came across this quote from Ken Wilber from our course textbook on integral theory, which I will read in part. Today, with the rise of powerful second tier technologies, artificial intelligence, humanity is once again faced with its most primordial nightmare, an explosive growth in right hand technologies that has not been met with by an equivalent growth in interior consciousness and wisdom. There are basically only two ways to control this technology, external legal enforcement or internal moral constraint. That is an interior growth in collective wisdom that seeks and implements wise use of technology. We cannot even begin to discuss the interior growth of wisdom and consciousness if we continue to ignore the interiors altogether. We will devise integral solutions to these global nightmares or we will very likely perish. I believe that this quote encompasses the challenge that we all face with the introduction of AI and the challenge that I decided to tackle, which then changed my life. But let's start with the usual strategic foresight method to go back in time at least twice as far before looking into the future. So the history of computer ethics is as short or as long as computers have been around. There are essentially four phases of cyber ethics in line with developments in the computer systems of the time. So these phases are firstly, from the late 1940s to the 1960s, where IT meant large standalone mainframe computers, the development of computer ethics concentrated on the impact of, tech, of computers as giant brains. And this is analogous to the ethical issues involving modern, modern artificial intelligence with issues such as can machines think? And if so, should we develop thinking machines? And if machines can be intelligent entities, what does that mean for our sense of self? And what does it mean to be human? And this marks the beginning of the ethical issues around AI. Other issues of this era included privacy, 
untoward collection of information and surveillance. In the 1950s, 1950 and 1954, Norbert Wiener founded the concept of information ethics as a new field of academic research, which is still honoured to this day. The second phase from the 1970s to the 80s, there was increasing commercialization and convergence of computers and communications networks. Ethical issues were raised around personal privacy, intellectual property and computer crime. During this time, James Moore developed his seminal work, What is Computer Ethics? Where he posits that computer ethics is the analysis of the nature and social impact of computer technology and the policies for the ethical use of such technology. Moore wanted a proactive approach to develop ethics alongside the development of technology, meaning that we need to assess the societal effects or risk unnecessary harm. The third phase from the 1990s to around 2010 was the era of the internet and the World Wide Web with additional ethical issues around free speech, anonymity, legal jurisdiction and virtual, virtual online communities. And suddenly the ethical issues had become global and transcended glo geographic boundaries, religions and cultures. And therefore the responses needed to be global too. And responses included the use of duty ethics and the social contract. The fourth phase up to today is the era of technological convergence with artificial intelligence and agents with decision-making capabilities, nanotechnology and bioinformatics. Bioinform Computer ethics must develop to reflect the questioning of the nature of consciousness by computers and agents and must develop a global framework of ethics. The critical aspect is that human agency and intention is still involved in the technological development of AI and must simultaneously develop ethical practices of AI and IT. So it was recognised that there was a need for a universal and global ethical framework, and these converged on four classical Western ethical worldviews as firstly idealism or denotological which is duty ethics where reality is mental rather than physical, for example, can't. Realism or virtue ethics, where reality is physical and learned through the senses, which is governed by the laws of nature rather than spirit, for example, Aristotle. Pragmatism or utilitarianism, where reality is a process, for example, Mill and Bentham. And existentialism, where reality is is defined by each autonomous individual and is a subjective choice. For example, Jean-Paul Sartre. However, a unified ethics theory for computers could only be derived from static principles like idealism, realism, and pragmatism rather than from existentialism, whose principles are dynamic. Ultimately, we need to translate these principles to legal scholarship terminology for AI as firstly ex ante measures to implement a proactive ethics and values based framework to mitigate the risk of bad AI and ex post measures to implement countermeasures that operate should the ex ante measures fail to prevent the creation of bad AI. So using these principles there have been some regionally based developments of ethics for AI. They raise the key requirements of the policy developers to themselves be expert in both the nature of the developing technology capabilities and in the developing understanding of the risks involved in the use of AI. In 2007, there was the development of the European Robotics Research Network or EURON roadmap concentrating on the proactive approach However, the roadmap documents the ambivalence for robo-ethics amongst some of the European AI development community. There were concerns with the regulations around AI relating to deep intelligence, which is the point where AI is the most intelligent, is more intelligent than the, than the smart, smartest person on earth, where the outcomes may not always be foreseeable. 
And once bad things happen as a result of deep intelligence, it may be already too late. There was also the UK House of Lords that developed a regulatory framework for AI research and development. And underpinning these actions was the desire to find the right balance between the benefits and the risk minimization of the technologies whilst building public trust. In 2016, the IEEE Standards Association launched the IEEE Global Initiative for Ethical Considerations on, in Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Systems based on a huge input from the world's AI ethics experts. And since then, there has been an explosion of initiatives to drive ethical frameworks, principles and policies, both at a regional and at an international level. These include the European Union GDPR and now the forthcoming EU AI Act, as well as the proposed California Privacy Rights Act. These frameworks are great for converging expert opinion and are typically prepared by governmental and intergovernmental think tanks and academics with some input from large IT companies. Now, here's a recent example of one of these ethical frameworks. This one is the UNESCO. Um, recommendation for ethical development and deployment of AI, which was released in November last year. And that includes high level values, principles and policies. Many governments, organisations and computer developers have developed similar ethical frameworks of their own. So whilst these high level frameworks are fantastic for creating a common worldview, the key challenge is how to make these high level principles accessible and useful to the average developer or AI producer and how to convince the general public that AI can be trusted to help and not to harm them. Now, during my subject research, I had come across a textbook by Dr. Sarah Speakerman from Vienna University that had some astounding ideas. Sarah painted future scenarios of wise AI developers and evil AI developers and the results of their AI work based on whether it may be useful and to create good in the world or create societal evil. In essence, she was saying that wise developers must not fall in love with their own ideas. They must seek a wide stakeholder base including future generations for input into their developer, developments. And they should take time to develop their products according to ethical development methodologies and values. Now using systems thinking methods, I analyzed and mapped out serious scenarios and found that her reasoning was sound. That ethical AI products should gain a market advantage on the basis of developing trust with the consumer base. So the idea of a wise AI developer is an interesting one. IT people and the industry generally sit at the orange or strategic level of the spiral dynamics chart and operate on the right-hand side over here of the integral theory chart. And this is what Sarah meant by the wicked AI developer, one that is obsessed with materialistic success and consumerism. As Wilbur had said in that quote that I mentioned previously, we need to push the developers towards collective wisdom with an injection of left-hand integral and yellow spiral thinking, as I've shown on the charts. And this has become my obsession to convert from within the IT industry. So here's how I've presented this conversation in my presentation to the IT industry, using the wisdom of Jim Dator's four archetype scenarios to introduce the concept of a disciplined society. This future is where people today feel that continued economic growth up here is either undesirable or unsustainable. These people realize that we should orient our lives 
around a set of fundamental values and find a deeper purpose in life than the pursuit of endless wealth and consumerism. And life should be disciplined around these fundamental values. So to create a desirable future and avoid societal collapse, it is important to create a fundamental change in society's worldview from our current continued growth future scenario to a disciplined future. A disciplined future is focused on a steady state equilibrium based on a set of fundamental societal values. Now, during this time, I was reacquainted with international standards and could see why they're important for solving the world's challenges. International standards are technical standards developed by international standards organizations and international standards are available for consideration and use worldwide and provide a neutral platform that unites communities for standards development and technological innovation that is independent of any government oversight and thus political flavor. Now, according to Forbes and Harvard Business Review, despite much global discussion and studies around ethical and responsible use of AI, and apart from the generalized data privacy regulation or GDPR, no country or region has yet crafted specific legislation or regulation with regards to the ethical use of AI or any issues regarding bias in the application or development of AI systems. Although there have been some regulatory proposals to ban some specific uses of AI, such as policing and violations of privacy, some people feel that legislation is not particularly well suited for the general regulation of AI due to the rapid pace of AI development, which far exceeds the capability to legislate. However, many countries do recommend that companies use a risk-based approach to developing and implementing AI systems and their regulatory proposals, such as those for the European Union do this too. International AI standards, such as those developed by ISO, by IEC and IEEE, thus pay, play a crucial role as a form of soft law in supporting responsible behaviour through voluntary industry use, as they contribute to boosting international trade and by managing AI risk. International standards, such as IEEE, support responsible behaviour of developers and consumers of this technology and they provide an adaptive and responsive approach to developing AI and associated risks. And they support a coordinated approach with international development and supply. As many AI technologies used in countries like Australia are created and developed in overseas markets. However, local in-country development is also stimulated to rise to the innovation challenge of international standards frameworks providing an opportunity to sell into overseas markets. For AI systems that are developed according to an international standard, it conveys a sense of trust to the consumer that this technology was created with care and with forethought. So I'm pleased to briefly introduce the IEEE to you as the world's largest professional association with a motto of advancing technology for humanity. IEEE, or more formally, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, develops international standards that cover many technologies with a high degree of social impact. This includes standards for ethical AI systems, data governance, and fairness in trade of data, digital intelligence, digital identity, and child online rights. Now, in 2016, the IEEE as approached Sarah Speakerman with the intention of adapting the concepts of her textbook into a new standard for trusted AI. Thus, IEEE launched the IEEE 7000 workgroup under the, under the IEEE Computer Society with Sarah as the, the vice chair to provide a guiding hand throughout its development into a technical standard. I discovered this initiative in 2017 whilst researching for my subject and immediately joined the initiative. So I've been fortunate enough to meet Sarah in person during a 7,000 workshop in, judgment, in Dublin early in 2020. And I'm fortunate I've been working closely with her on the development and the launch of this standard. 
the IEEE 7000 Working Group has had 39 active members from all parts of the world, um, including Europe, Africa, Asia, Middle East, South America, US and Canada and of course Australia. And during the five years in development, we have had seven drafts, three phases and formally responded to over a thousand comments. So in May um, of last year, 2021, um, 77 out of 92 external working group experts voted in favour of publishing the 81 page IEEE 7000 standard. So, oops, sorry, I'll just go forward. Oops, sorry. So this is the standard at a high level. The scope and purpose of the IEEE 7000 standard is to establish a set of processes by which engineers and technologists can include consideration of ethical values throughout the stages of concept exploration and development, which encompasses system initiation, analysis and design. And the goal of the standard is to enable organisations to design systems with explicit consideration of individual and societal ethical values. Now, the value of using IEEE 7000 standard for executives, managers and for business owners, 7000 provides opportunity to incentivise responsible innovation amongst their service providers by using this standard to develop or to acquire AI or IT services and products. And it allows them to embed their organisational values transparently into the automated processes that serve their organisation and their customers. And this widens their business value proposition, reduces the risks of investing in developing technologies as, as ethical challenges are identified early on. Now for the system developer, this standard goes far beyond a list of value principles to follow. It provides a process for embedding organizationally relevant values into the systems that they design and develop, providing a structured process to go from value principles to practice. And it's compatible with existing system development, project and risk management methodologies that they use. And acts as an overlay process to be incorporated into their own practice. And it helps them to understand philosophy, ethics and values affecting their stakeholders and how they might be impacted by technology and allows them to plan and to prototype for this at the front end of the project. Essentially, the standard is not a high level list of policies or principles or a list of values to follow. It's actually a very practical how to implement these things using a detailed and coherent process. So in essence, it is embedding the yellow left-hand wisdom and principles into an orange right-hand format using the spiral integral model terminologies. And given that this standard is under consideration for endorsement with the forthcoming European Union AI legislation, it may well turn spiral blue. So let's explore whose ethics we're talking about in IEEE 7000. 7000 uses the same unified ethical theories as I discussed earlier, based on the three Western ethical theories, utilitarian ethics, which intends to maximize well-being benefits and minimize harms, virtue ethics, which defines the kind of person that we should be, and duty ethics, which describes what we ought to do. It also unites with other culturally appropriate ethical theories and traditions relevant to the world region in which a system is to operate and can be applied to derive human values. So 7000 uses the ethical theories to derive human values, which are a set of beliefs that helps a person in making a judgment of what is more important and how to act. Values like privacy, autonomy, inclusion, community, environmental sustainability, fairness, equality, dignity, trust, and justice. The standard employs value-based engineering to answer one question, how shall I act as a system engineer, product innovation manager, or as the executive responsible for a system? The response to this question is highly personal and highly transparent. 
Ethics in IEEE 7000 isn't about personal morals. It's about corporate system decision-making that enables positive social values and prevents negative social values. IEEE 7000 is about responsible innovation and taking responsibility for your system's decisions by embedding ethical values into your system by following a defined and accountable process. So this is what the 7000 process looks like at a high level. There are two stages. Firstly, the concept exploration stage and then the development stage. Within the concept exploration stage, there is a concept of operations and context exploration process, which defines how a system is expected to operate and its context of use. Then comes the ethical values elicitation and prioritization process, which is used to derive and rank the values of the stakeholders using the lenses of the various ethical theories whilst identifying the ethical issues and the harms and the benefits. Within the development stage, there is the ethical requirements definition process, which derives the ethical requirements from the core values. Then there is the ethical risk-based design process, which realizes the ethical values and the required functionality in the system or design. The transparency management process sits across all of the stages and the four processes and is all about sharing with the stakeholders how the, the developer has addressed their ethical concerns during the design. The intent that is that any of these processes can be used iteratively as required. And when used together, they ensure an ethically aligned design is produced. Now, I'd like to also briefly mention a case study. IEEE 7000 with value-based engineering was used earlier last year with UNICEF in Africa, developing a Yoma platform for the African youth and de talent development. Yoma was initially conceived as developing an AI-driven talent calculation machine for African youth following a mainstream narrative of today's IT innovation. This initial approach didn't consider the social values of the participants or the associated harms or benefits of these. However, when the IEEE 7000 value-based engineering process was introduced, Yoma pivoted to a more holistic community-centered approach to address skills development and employment challenges and to increase youth agency within the community. So I'd invite you to explore the Yoma platform and to hear a detailed account that 7000 made from Lohan Spees, the Yoma Chief Technology Officer through the video testimonial on the Vienna University webpage link, which I show at the bottom of the screen down here. Now, since the 7000 project has completed, I have become involved in the IEEE Society on Social Implications of Technology or SSIT. This society organizes international conferences, technical meetings and public policy submissions concerning issues such as sustainable development of humanitarian technology, ethics, human values and future societal impact of technology advances. SSIT has a standards committee of which I am chair. We have a number of working groups developing social impact technical standards, including those on emulated empathy in AIS, provenance of indigenous people's data, which has an, a significant Australian representation, the recommended practices for addressing technology facilitated interpersonal control, which is a highly topical issue at the moment with incidents of domestic abuse on the rise and the recommended practice for um, ESG and SDG goals. These working groups are available for you to join if you're interested and make a difference in the world by applying ethical theories and values into engineering practices and standards. And if you're interested, please let me know and I can put you in touch with the relevant working groups. So in summary, I have charted my own personal journey from a Swinburne University subject to address a 21st century challenge. 
to becoming involved in a global movement to change the worldview of engineering and IT communities involved in AI development through global industry focused standards. I have highlighted some of the strategic foresight tools that I've used and continue to use in particular to analyze the value of one particular standard that I'm involved in, the IEEE 7000, and to explain why I believe this new standard is so critical for evolving a new practice called value-based engineering. The IEEE 7000 provides AI developers and corporate executives as a means for taking responsibility for their system's decisions by embedding positive ethical values that their stakeholders care about into their system by following a defined and accountable process and by identifying and mitigating the risk of social harms to them. This is done through the combined lenses of the defined ethical theories of duty ethics, virtue ethics, and utilitarianism, as well as any other cultural, relevant cultural theories. And it allows developers to follow a defined step-by-step -step process that will fit comfortably with their organization's own methodologies for system development or procurement project and risk management. The standard is available for use now from the IEEE website. However, the work of the IEEE SSIT Standards Committee continues and develops many new and critical social impact standards to help realise the benefit of AI in this world and mitigate the risk of societal harm from their development. Now, thank you all for your attention. And my, as mentioned, my name is Ruth Lewis and you can find me at my website, technologyforsight.biz and my email address is on the screen. And please feel free to reach out and contact me with any questions or queries, but I'm very happy to take your questions now. And also um, we have some possible discussion topics um, related to the, to the presentation in our open forum. Um, so thank you again for your attention and I really appreciate um, that your patience with the delayed start for this presentation, thanks. Thank you very much, Ruth. And we invite everyone now for the open forum to, <clears throat> to type in the chat box or feel free to unmute yourselves, raise your hands if you would like to ask Ruth um, a question. And I guess I can start off, Ruth. Um, I was very interested in this topic and how I would explain this issue to other people is um, if AI were to make decisions on a, a classical um, ethical dilemma like the trolley problem, for example, and and I think um, I may have misunderstood what AI ethics was about. So um, it's not really in order to make those kinds of decisions or to to implant those kinds of um, ethical and moral standards in AI. But I was very interested to to find out the three uh, different kinds of ethical standards, like utilitarianism, that would be embedded. Uh, maybe you can shed some light on why those frameworks. Um, yeah, sorry. The, so the trolley problem is very much an issue. Um, I'm sure that they're wrestling with with um, the autonomous system, um, autonomic, autonomous vehicles um, as those are being developed and, and to, to a limited extent are being deployed. Um, so be specific to the three ethical theories that you were talking about, you were saying utilitarianism, duty ethics and virtue ethics. Yes. Those are the Western ones, plus the, as I mentioned, in, in the case of 7,000, um, other rel relevant cultural theories um, related to where the system is going to be deployed. Um, so they, as and that's interesting because during, I think my final topic in the Master's Strategic Foresight, we did actually do a unit which covered, um, I think there were about 10 different types of ethical theories. But when I did further exploration, it actually boiled down to the three when they were in regard to computer ethics. So that kind of unified all the way, what I call the Western philosophies um, that were usable within the computer or, or the information systems AI realm. Um, do you, sorry, are you saying 
how were they used or why those three um, were selected because some some cultures or some individuals mm. or organizations may have uh, different value systems and they might want to reflect that in the artificial intelligence that they're building so why those three um, theories they're more frameworks I suppose they are theories which can be used to to um to uh, apply to actually derive the um, the values, the human values, which are the the key thing that you want to embed into the developing systems. So it's like a filter. It's it's the questions you ask. Do you want? Um, would it be useful to to run through a little use case or something to explain how it's used? Oh, yes, definitely. And then we have uh, another question here in the chat box afterwards. Thank you. Ruth. Oh, hang on. Sorry. I'm, I know because when anyway, just I'm just seeing how I take this out of presenter mode. Um, so I've got some additional slides that might be useful to explain how they use. Uh, stop sharing just a minute. Sorry, <laughs> I'll just get to the bit that's relevant. Um, I know it's hard when, we, when we're also talking about these things theoretically, um, but I could go into a little more, more depth of how that works. Sorry. Just pop that into the, oh, hang on. Just see if I can share this again. I'll do this. Um, share screen. Sorry. Oh, this is very strange. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Can you see that? Um, yes. Okay, sorry. So this is actually a part of the process, which is called the ethical values elicitation and prioritization process, which as I said. Um, sort of an early part of the actual process from the IEEE 7000 standard. And this is all around how you obtain a rank values and value, uh, the, the actual values that have, and um, with your stakeholders and how you identify the core values in the form of what we call value clusters. So um, here is, you use this, these three ethical theories like a lens, if you like. And as I mentioned, you can actually use um, any other cultural theories that might be relevant, perhaps, you know, an Indigenous culture. Um, but these three are, are at the minimum, you have to use these. So, for example, the utilitarian ethics, the virtue ethics and the duty ethics, um, they all use a similar process where you identify you stakeholders, you, and in the case of utilitarian ethics, you look, you have a description of what the consequential effects are of the, um, the system that you want to apply and, do, um, and does it support or harm the, the values of the stakeholders? And then you identify the values and you do the same with the virtue ethics. It has, um, rather than looking at the consequential effects, you actually look at how it affects the character um, of, the per of the stakeholder and does it support or harm? And then you identify the virtues and the vices. And the case of duty ethics is similar thing, but this, in this case, you look at the descriptions, the effects on the personal, that maxim or the highest personal values that that person owns and you identify the values. 
as well as deriving any improvement ideas of a system. And you actually identify and rank values and value demonstrators for the stakeholders using these three ethical theories. Um, so I've got a, just a little example here where in this example, um, sorry, it's a little bit cut out of a use case where this particular use case was to do with applying a video phone. Um, sorry, I've got a picture of it. Um, it's a disability video phone in an aged care setting. Okay. So, and, and that's sort of, uh, you had the concept of operations and context exploration. Um, so in this case, you're, you're using the filter of um, utilitarian ethics. So you might describe the stakeholder effect of being in this case, what I've called the aged user, the person who would use the video phone, perhaps in, in an aged care setting. Um, and the, the consequential effects of using the video phone might be that it helps them to make their own decisions and therefore it supports, it supports their values um, in a positive way. And the values might be that it actually fosters privacy and autonomy of the aged user. Um, in addition, you know, for example, the pri private data uh, would be stored elsewhere, so that might actually harm their privacy. Um, so that's actually the value which is harmed. So you sort of go through this process. Maybe you might consider some other stakeholders, such as the family of the aged user, which and um, the effect might be it reduces the reliance on them to oversee their needs as they will, the aged user will be more independent. And so it actually support that. Um, support safety and autonomy. Um, but on the other hand, the aged care facility may feel that um, their staff require privacy um, and that they may be concerned that there may be harm according to legal risk, may introduce legal risk. So that's actually a harm based value um, and so on. So in the case of virtue ethics, you do a similar thing. Um, through a virtue ethics filter, but you look at the description, the effect of the character um, and so on. I mean, I won't go into too much detail, but you can see how you do this and similar thing with uh, doing it for the personal maxim, which is the highest personal rules governing the person's life or the stakeholder's life. Okay. And each time you derive the improvement ideas and as a result of that, you come up with a set of ethical values, which you then um, put into what we call value clusters and then derive what we call core values. And this is, um, and then you rank those. So things like inclusiveness, autonomous, autonomy, privacy, safety, and sustainability. And se separate might be profit, um, which is not derived obviously from some values or it might be, I suppose, but that's the way they've, and then you actually then go ahead and derive your, um, you have what we call a, a value demonstrator, which actually demonstrates how the, the value is, dem is actually actioned in the world. And from, and then so on, you, you derive values and then um, the design. So I hope that kind of answers your questions why it's important. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. I, was, I was very curious exactly about how um, different uh, theories on ethics would be uh, ranked and applied um, for for AI, because for human beings, it, it def differs on a case to case basis. Um, and we have another question here from Mark in the chat. Uh, Mark, if you'd like to, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, sure. Um, no, at first, just thank you very much. It's a really inspiring presentation. I just wanted to sort of think around, because uh, as you mentioned, those very high level principles, sort of the processes that you've just mapped out, but I wanted to sort of take it a little farther and really thinking around, not just the, okay, you've shown a bit on the implementation, but how one would assess that, how one assesses that they've really complied with that process? Do they second guess their assumptions when looking at what they've sort of um, 
come up with with the risks and the the mitigating factors this the or or is it really just completion of the process that would get them a compliance uh check i was just curious on on your thoughts of that or if there's any mechanisms that are being established um in the working group thank you over Oh no, thank you. So, so you're worried about compliance. Um, so currently there are no actual compliance processes. There's no audit, formal audit, though to be honest, I'm about to have a chat with, with um, the, the, the executive director in IEEE to see how we might be able to enable that. So yes, you're right. It is around compliance with the process. And I guess that is self-compliance that you are following the process, although the process is really quite detailed and it is um, adherence to both outcomes and also the process itself. And the outcomes need to be quite detailed um, in how you actually follow through the process and <clears throat> what the resultants, resultant will be. Um, <coughs> for example, health and safety issues are given priority uh, for, for dealing with and mitigating those risks. And in fact, there's even a, a part in there fairly early on that says, you know, if you don't meet certain of these um, issues or if, if the risks are too great, you, you might actually even consider abandoning this, this particular endeavour. So um, it is, it is self-regulating, you're right. There's, um, there are other um processes or certification standards that IEEE are stand are developing, which is an AI certification process, um, which is separate but related to the 7000 process. Um, and that I believe is due to launch probably about mid-year or maybe around May, just before mid-year. Um, and that is where the IEEE will issue will actually go through a certification process and independent audit, but that actually, is, the intention is that it's an audit of a, an actually existing system, not necessarily a design, and then issue a mark if, if that system is deemed to be compliant with certain aspects, with certain values like transparency or accountability and so on. So thanks for the question, Mark. Thank you. And if anybody um, else would like to ask a question, uh, please feel free to do so. There were so many um, possible discussion topics that- uh, You want me to go yeah. back to the questions, the questions that I was asking. Yes. I can share those again, because I just think they're intriguing, to be honest. Um, sorry, I'll just go back to- to my Maybe question. Ruth, um, while you're pulling that up, you can already answer. Uh, since this session will be uploaded for public uh, view, uh, maybe you can can help people understand what what's the importance of doing this. Uh, what what are the risks for um, the unregulated development of AI? Oh, I think I went through those. Yeah, already. <laughs> Um, and I think I mentioned the example of the Clearview AI, which I think is, that happened probably about October last year that was in all the press in Australia, but that's a US-based company. Has anyone heard of Clearview? That's just one example where um, this particular company has collected billions, literally billions of um, images from social media from public sources and they were freely selling it to the police agencies around the world. And this really does affect everybody, um, but there are certain members of the community who are obviously at greater risk um, for public disclosure in terms of where they live and what they look like. And, you know, maybe people with, there are people around with restraining orders and all sorts of things who are at risk um, of having, this information solved to a third party, it's it's really quite frightening. Um, but that's just one, one example, which is fairly unsavory. And, and fortunately in Australia, this particular company has um, been ordered to destroy those images, but you know, I assume they're still doing what they're doing commercially 
um, around the world. So I don't know, just as a point of topic, has anyone heard of Clearview AI? I think they're based in New York. I see uh, Joyce is raising her hand. She has heard of Clearview AI. For myself, not so much. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so so that's just one, oops, sorry. That's just one example, sorry. And we have the hand of uh, Kimberly. Uh, you'd like to ask a question? Actually, I was just uh, saying that I, I knew of Clearview and that situation. Um, that was my virtual hand raise to Joyce's. Um, I could ask a question though, if you want me to uh, jump in with that one. Yes, please feel free to do so. I actually have a vision. I am a live person here, not just a disembodied voice. Um, sorry for the darkness here. Um, yeah, I actually have a couple of questions for you. But first of all, thanks so much, Ruth. Um, really interesting work. And it, it's kind of uh, wonderful to hear your, your story of going through that program and, and what it led to and the connection to your engineering background. Um, I'm curious, though, I kind of want to go back to the question around the, the values, though, and it's around this, um, so you, you drew the line above Sartre, because in existentialism, the, mm. it, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's uh, what you call dynamic values versus static, mm. and I, I thought, okay, well, this, this sounds like it sort of leads into questions of AI and consciousness, and the function that it it plays, because um, in the Sartre, I'm, I mean, I'm just I'm just um, I'm making assumptions here that might not actually be true of your work, but that um, you needed to work with fixed information, not this sort of notion that in consciousness we construct things in a dynamic way. But I'm not sure if you were actually getting into consciousness there at all with the existentialism point or what it was, but like separating essentially intelligence and intelligent systems from consciousness, which requires um, uh, yeah, a different type of perception, one where we actually feel, which we can't necessarily ascribe to machines. That's right, exactly. And and with, with a, an intelligent agent, um, one needs to, either provide instructions or the means to derive instructions um, for them to make a decision yeah. in, a, in a moral sense. So having a dynamic system is extraordinarily challenging, as I'm sure you can understand, for them to deal with. So it's much better to have, a, I suppose, some sort of static framework for them to understand yeah. what's right or what's wrong, hence, hence the dis and look, it's not my work. This is work that was derived probably back in the sort of the 80s and 90s into the 2000s that, exist that existentialism would be far too challenging. Um, and I haven't seen anything since then that would indicate otherwise for the yeah, way think, that values are derived. I think that makes sense. I, I don't know that AI is really advanced there and it may not even. Um, I do have another question. And so you've done all this great work and it's been integrated into the IEEE 7000 and it's available for people to use. I'm curious about the uptake. Like if you have a sense of its application to some of the problems that are being um, addressed in different companies. If you're hearing yep. any stories, outcomes, you can kind of extend your work to, to share that at some point. And to be honest, it is very new. It was released in September of last year okay. as probably one of the first standards to be published, which isn't to say it's the standard to be published. Um, I'm also involved in the ISO IEC um, standards, which have published a few initial standards. Um, it, I'm involved through Standards Australia. So in the case of ISO, you have um, geographic representation and experts, whereas IEEE is a little bit different because you, anyone can join. You don't have to be an engineer. You just, you know, you can just join or even be a Standards Association member. Um, so it's quite a different model for, for consensus building. Um, and I quite like that open forum. Um, I would really welcome 
participant, other participants, other futurists to join as well, because I, I think we bring a breadth and a depth of understanding and a future perception, which I think is really valuable, particularly with these sort of knotty, wicked problems. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, sorry, in terms of uptake, um, I'm working really hard behind the scenes. I've, what I've, I mean, I mentioned one case, which is the Yoma, but that was actually even prior to release. Since then, I know um, that there's been quite a bit of interest in Europe. Um, I'm not sure about the US. In Australia, it's, it's really hard. I feel like we are pushing a ball uphill um, for various reasons. But however, I've had what I would call some engagement um, presentations I've given to um, just to sort of boost awareness with government departments, with particular projects, um, which state we have sort of a federal and a, and a state government level um, executive here. So I've given um, presentations both at the federal and also certain state government entities and projects within those, particularly where they, they are projects which are very culturally sensitive and they are considering using the 7,000 standard within their project because they need deep engagement um, at a culturally sensitive level um, for the solutions or the, the AI solutions that they're, they're going to implement to work. And so we're, this is where, similar to the Yoma example, it can be really valuable because you're talking about very you know, critical societal issues that you really want. To, you don't just want to bring in a heavy handed approach. You want to, it to actually be um, absorbed and used and, and derive good within that culture or that society. Um, here I'm talking about indig Indigenous Australians in a, in a very risk risky situation where there's been a lot of public, I mean, I've I think some in perhaps in the Australian setting, if anyone would probably know what I'm talking about, there's been some just horrific treatment um, of uh, in some situations historically, and that's obviously trying to rectify some of those situations it through often through sort of techno technology driven means. Um, so yeah, um, that's where this is, can be quite valuable. But at this stage, I'd say, given it's only fairly recently been released, it's really a matter of getting the word out there. Um, yeah, so I'm hoping we'll, for all the work we put in, we'll get some some clear uptake. <laughs> yeah, no, I hope so too. Thank you so much for sharing. Hi, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kimberly. Um, and were you going to pull up the, uh, the, question, the topic yes. slide? Yes, the question yeah. slide. Yeah, let me just share again, sorry. Can everyone see that? Yes, we can see that. Great, so uh, do you want me to just go through them? So policy frameworks versus mo model processes. So, so this is a really interesting question, I think, because as I mentioned in everything that I've been involved with, particularly um, both in terms of, you know, surveying what's going on in the world of um, uh, ethical AI, um, I'd say 99% is in the area of policy frameworks and particularly where I am in Australia, that seems to be what they, they're really concentrating. But as I mentioned before, my concern is that it's so high level and I've seen some use cases which um, some fairly large companies Australia have been attempting. I, I do, they seem to get stuck on how to actually embed or apply the values of ethical frameworks and policies into actually the, the AI systems that they're implementing, um, they seem to really go off track a little bit, but that's where I feel that a model process is quite helpful. But, but I think that's a really interesting question to discuss. Um, the next one is around control, which is the, the this is the ex ante versus the ex post <laughs> question, control by legal enforcement versus sort of technology standards. 
um, you know, um, how useful is legal enforcement when it is it does take so long to um, to legislate versus technology standards, and how do we address the ambivalence of AI developers? So I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, if you think about, and I've sort of alluded to some of the, I suppose, worldviews, but when you use models such as causal layered analysis, for example, and you look at some of the myths or images of say AI developers or coders, um, what are their myths, you know, and, and how do you change their, their worldview? How do you change those myths to, to incorporate responsibility um, when they're very much within that sort of orange spiral worldview? Um, the next one is around, are these societal risks of unregulated development of AI overstated? Um, what other strategic foresight tools could, would you use to analyze the current situation? And the paradox, if AI systems can do things in unplanned and unanticipated ways, um, who or what can certify them as safe? <laughs> Which is sort of alludes back to Mark's question too. Um, so does, is anyone, would anyone like to pick up any of those questions or perhaps some other questions? Well, I, I am interested in um, control by legal enforcement versus technology standards because uh, what's ethical may not always be legal and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps anybody else uh, in the chat uh, is interested in some of these topics. And Ruth, you mentioned that you welcome people to join uh, the IEEE. Um, maybe you can share also information on how people can do that. Oh, through the working group. Yeah, look, just contact me. Um, that's probably the easiest. Um, I, I mentioned some of the working groups under the um, Society for Social Implications of Technology Standards Committee. Um, and standards working groups, but there are many other groups as well. I, I've mentioned a few and not all of them. So, um, but they're all developing standards, some of which have been going for a couple of if years, some which have just literally kicked off, but they're always um, run by very passionate people <laughs> who, who want to make a difference in the world, which is fantastic. Ruth, you talked about the context of the the context of application, but I but I wonder if we might turn that around of the context of development in the case of the ambivalence of AI developers, because you know um, they have a job to do, and I working in an environment where it's all about uh, hands and keyboards, um, there's sort of a they're incentivized to be ambivalent in some ways about, and I I will just. I don't know what topic you might apply that to, but let's say it's AI in this case, but you know, it's just that get the work done um, is in opposition to get the work done with um, all the care needed for the outcomes that, that we really desire. And mm. so um, unless, and, and that goes up to the larger system, right? And the growth orientation, because companies are, you know, they're trying to turn this stuff out because it's, you know, it's, it's all about productivity. So I'm just I'm just wondering if there's something there. I, I don't have any answers, but I think that that to me is is kind of the question that um, grabs me the most here. Yes, yes, it's it's a huge issue, isn't it? This is that whole thing mm -hmm. I said about you know with with the integral theory, and I'm, I'm not sure how many people on the forum are uh, familiar with those particular tools. They were really embedded quite strongly in the in the Swinburne course, integral theory, spiral dynamics, all those sort of things. And that's what really grabbed me because that's the background mm. that I've come from. Exactly. Productivity, uh, get the job mm. done. Um, but the other, I'm actually just commenced some discussions with a couple of um, areas that in particular business analysts um, and other engineering areas. There are some people who perceive that there are strategic advantages for enabling a more strategic approach amongst um, developers or business analysts um, to actually 
utilize some of these methods to, to take a little more control. Um, and it's all around self-control, isn't it? But also to add value to the project. If you are able to engage more fully with your stakeholders, not just your users, but the what we call the direct and indirect stakeholders, um, you actually create a better product and therefore it's better for the market, it's better for, for, for your boss and for the people who are actually, for the investors, the funders of this particular initiative. Um, user, this actually goes far beyond what we call user experience of the product. This is actually reaches right down to their fundamental values, meaning that they feel safe in not just in, in engaging in this, this particular service or product, not just as a user, but within society itself. Um, the example, for example, um, of say, um, when I talk about indirect stakeholders, um, those who aren't necessarily use, using the system, but nevertheless are affected by the system. In the case of that Clearview AI use case, obviously the people whose images <laughs> being utilised become indirect stakeholders. So uh, even if it's not quite such an in, insidious um, system, but it's actually um, a system designed for good in the case, you know, I use the use case of the video phone, um, we are actually trying to provide value in a good sense, then it's really important to really understand how people feel and what will allow them to trust the, the technology or the system and, and what will mitigate the harms of the system to their situation. And all that's all of the stakeholders. So giving the developers the tools to be able to do that is, is actually value added, adding to them as well. And the other thing that I've discussed with these various bodies is that it also enables them to resolve what have previously been conflicts of interest, I think, from an ethical point of view. All of these professional associations do have ethical codes of conduct, means, meaning do the right thing, essentially. And you're right, you know, often we as developers or, or engineers, um, business analysts, um, AI developers and such, sorry about that, my internet was completely gone. <laughs> In the middle of a storm, um, we still got some people here. I know we're we're about a minute after the hour, so are we still going? Or yes, yes, sure. uh, you were in the middle of um, answering Kimberly's question when you got disconnected, so we weren't um, able to hear hear your entire answer. Um, yeah, I was just you so the, I was just saying that I was talking about conflicts of interest between personal values and. Um, the project that you're assigned to do. So I said, it's much, much easier. I think there's definitely advantages from an employer point of view where, you know, you, you don't have those conflicts of interest and then you're more likely to retain your staff. Mm -hmm. I think that was the end of my answer. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> Apologies. Yeah. I can't do anything was, about what happened to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> worth worth hearing. Thank you so much again. That's thank been, you. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks everyone for coming along. Are there any other questions or any thoughts in terms of um, those topics that I'll, I'll just put them up again? Sorry. You know what's been running through my mind is um, that whole thing between moral morals and ethics, and how we've been raised in Western culture to be very functional individuals. So, and to be aware of your own uh, moral or ethical values uh, requires a journey of consciousness, you know, um, because we're not uh, educated and socialized to be aware of these uh, of values. So, I was just thinking, how likely is it that developers in general would be conscious of their values? And probably a second question would be, would they be likely to go the journey of becoming aware and really coming to grips with their values? Well, I think that's in two parts. I think I, I'm hopeful for future generations of developers and engineers. Um, 
I do note that many of the IT and engineering courses do seem to now have um, units or even subunits of morality and, and moral values and you know, how to recognise right from wrong and good from, from evil and all that sort of thing. It's something that I never really had the benefit of, but then I did my course a long time ago. Um, I also note similar sort of things going through, say, MBA courses where executives um, are more aware now of ethical, sustainable governance issues and the SDGs, you know, the, the UNESCO Sustainable Development Goals um, and morality and things like that. I think it's now become very embedded in the um, education system, particularly in, you know, the early years of undergraduate before they launched into sort of the more the technical side and in the postgraduate education side as well. In terms of the existing ones, um, I, that's where I'm, I'm primarily thinking the advantage will be of these model processes. But again, they need the decision to use them would have to be made by you know, but the executives in, in conjunction with the program management to and with the purpose of wanting to, to do good, to provide good social values and mitigate social harms. Um, and then using this model process will assist the, the developers or the engineers to actually understand and apply the, this moral reasoning Oh, thanks, Ruth. And another question just springs to mind uh, when we're yeah. talking about, um, you know, existing developers and ones coming through the system um, and knowing that men and women manage our affairs very differently and uh, we have different ways of uh, interacting. Um, would you like to say something about the gender aspect? of uh, AI and ethics and uh, developing and developers? Oh, goodness, yes. Well, that's interesting. Um, certainly the AI developers and the, those who are attracted to the profession do tend to be obviously heavily male-oriented. They love the tech, tech side. What's really interesting in this space is I have found um, not necessarily technical people, but a lot of legal people who are becoming involved and not just on an operational side, but also teaching courses in universities and technical colleges. And, they've, and they're heavily women, um, he, sorry, oriented towards women. Um, they are legal practitioners um, and they, are, um, they have social science backgrounds like anthropologists, you know, I'm talking postdoctoral studies, um, particularly on the academic side, there's a lot of um, female representation in that side. So what we're really seeing is a convergence between the social sciences and the engineering side to really create, I think, what I hope will emerge to be a, a new form, a, a combination of that um, dedicated towards, you know, positive social values um, through technology deployment and creation. So that's an interesting question. <laughs> Thank you. Mm, thanks, Ruth. And that probably, Joe, I'll go forward to say, I did mention during my presentation that, um, and this goes toward the development of legislation or standards as well, that where one needs to have skills in both areas, but typically, and this is where it's, you know, standards development is, is so good because you have representations from all sorts of areas, the academic, you know, the operational, the, the, the um, industry, um, developers, vendors, um, the user community and, and all sorts of different backgrounds. And it's that combination of experience and perception that 
and through the consensus process that actually um, develops a really strong and emerging field, I think, which I think will then translate hopefully to a shift toward a shift in mindset in, in the future of capabilities um, of engineers and developers. And I'm sorry I missed the earlier part of your presentation, Ruth, because I was one of those people that didn't check that it was, <laughs> there was a time um, disruption there. But um, I was wondering, because business is very much now being very accountable to social impact. So I was wondering what social impact that awareness of social impact, does that work towards making people more moral, more ethical in their approaches and more to be more, is that a driver towards being more conscious, would you say, of yes. for the developers yes, to become more conscious? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but I think that's part of the problem. They're, they're more conscious of, of their of social impact they it's all the time it's it's in the press particularly that the like the clearview ai <laughs> uh, use case they're aware of that but they don't they don't know how necessarily how to translate the intentions into the you know the actual on the ground practical process um that's why seven that seven thousand standards really valuable and where i think many of these policies and principles that are currently being formulated and published need to really be driven toward more practical frameworks for people to apply, for developers to apply into their projects. How do you actually, what tools do you use? And that's where 7,000 is really valuable. And I think it's probably going to be the first of, of a number of tools. Thank you. We'd like to, to, of course, thank you so much, Ruth, and thank you everyone for participating. Uh, please uh, watch out for the email that we will be sending once the recording of this is available. You have Ruth's contact information and her website, um, technologyforesight.biz, and you can reach her at ruth at technologyforesight.biz if you'd like to reach out to her or if you have um, intentions or interests in joining this uh, technical Working Group on IEEE 7000. Thank you very much, Ruth, and thank you everyone so much for joining us. And uh, we'll see you at the next um, open discussion on the ethics and philosophy of futures. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.